Good morning, River Church. Good morning. Good morning, and happy new year. I want to tell you about some things that are coming up. Um, first of all, we, uh, with this new year, uh, some of our Bible studies, all of our Bible studies and, and gospel communities are going to be launching again, starting. Some of them didn't take a break, and some of them did take breaks. So if you want to, but are not yet in a gospel community, which is what we call our small groups around here, or if you want to be in a men's Bible study, a ladies' Bible study, uh, they all have different schedules, but the step one is if you just put that um, on your contact, or put that on your, on your uh, connection card, that's what we call these, right? Connection card. Put that on your connection card and turn it in. Put it in the offering basket as it goes by uh, later, on, later on this morning, and uh, Pastor Billy uh, or I will we'll, we'll get you connected to uh, a group. Now, if you know what group, maybe you've heard about a group, uh, maybe there's a group meeting in your part of town and you already know what the group is, you just want to get in, then put that on there. Or if you don't know, you just want to be in a group, be connected, then put that on the card and turn it in. Uh, speaking of this connection card, if you are brand new, first time here, we're, welcome, we're, we're, we're glad you, uh, you, you're here. We, we want to welcome you. And one of the ways we want to do that is my wife Lydia and I would like to meet you after the service. So if you would fill out the, the connection card, but don't turn it in. Uh, wait and, and meet uh, Lydia and me uh, at that table back there after the service. And we've got a little gift for you. I want to get to know you, hear your name, uh, and hear a little bit about your story. So that's what's going on. Um, and with that, I want to invite you to stand and say hi, shake a hand, maybe meet a new person uh, right now. Let's do that. All right, again, welcome. Glad you're here. If you would join me, if you would join me in prayer. I'll pray out loud and you can uh, pray silently and join me, agree, agree with me in prayer. God, there's a newness and a freshness uh, to the day that we long for, that we uh, crave. We want, we want newness and, 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 and freshness, a new start, a new beginning, um, a clean slate. We want all that. And we, uh, we believe that is what you offer. Uh, and so we're in the right place on this, on this uh, sunny January 1st of 2023. We're in the right place. Um, so would you, would you um, come and move among us today? Would you speak de deeply into our hearts? We don't even know, know what we need, but we trust that you know exactly what we need. So would you speak into our hearts? Would you conform our, our will to yours? And would you, would you increase our affection for you? I just have a sense that today's the beginning of a, of a really good year for, for, for us. And so we, we lean into you uh, for that, God. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So yeah, so today is, uh, is, is, is obviously the first day of a new year. Today is uh, the day in which we return now to our study of the, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we've been... We've been uh, Celebrating Christmas for a number of weeks now, so, so now we can go back to regularly scheduled programming, but I mean in the best sense of the word. And uh, so I want to just remind you just ever so briefly, because uh, we've slept a few times since we studied the book of Matthew, I want to remind you ever so briefly what the, the, the main theme and the main idea is here. The main theme, the main idea is that Jesus quickly in the book of Matthew gets to his, 
his teaching, what he wants us to understand is that, that there, is, there is a kingdom. He calls it the kingdom of heaven. This, this, realm, um, this, this, <clears throat> this realm in which we can reside. It, it's not just a place. In fact, in fact, right now in 2023, it's not primarily a place, the kingdom of heaven. It's primarily this condition, this relationship that we have with the Lord. There is the kingdom of heaven... And then there is the kingdom of the world. And these are two very real kingdoms. And every one of us in this room today, just like in Jesus' day, every one of us in this room, we live in one kingdom or the other. You're either residing in the kingdom of heaven or you continue to reside in the kingdom of the world. And, and, and that's okay. I'm not judging you. I just want to compel you to believe that the kingdom of heaven is a way, way better place to reside. And so in this kingdom of heaven, Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus repeatedly gives us these, these upside-down sort of teachings. The, the ethic of Jesus is, is upside-down in comparison to the kingdom of the world. It makes no sense. Now, probably those of us that follow Jesus would say, actually, it's the right way to live. It's maybe the right side up. But, but compared to like the normal, the normal way of the world... Jesus' kingdom is upside down, where he says, like, the first will be last. So those of us that are always racing to be the first in line, Jesus is in the kingdom of heaven ultimately and for eternity, will be last. <clears throat> and Jesus makes upside down statements like, like don't, just, don't just tolerate your enemies. C certainly don't persecute your enemies. Um, actually love your enemies. And that's, again, upside down when we look at it through the filter, the lens of, of the world. And Jesus makes statements like, blessed are the poor in spirit, like the humble, those who don't think too highly of themselves. Blessed are, are the poor in spirit, for, for, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so, you know, we've got, I've preached nine weeks out of out of the Gospel of Matthew already, so I'm not going to re-preach every ethic that Jesus introduces, but it's just this radically different kingdom, um, a kingdom in which power and prestige are not seen in the same light. So, so, so God has a different perspective on power and prestige and success. It's the upside down kingdom of heaven. So we've been talking about that for the last nine weeks and, and I've been compelling you and I've been compelling myself internally to, to, to wrestle with which kingdom do I reside in? And the beauty of, the beauty of days like January 1st <clears throat> and really any day, but symbolically January 1st, the beauty of it is the, the Lord offers to us a fresh start, a, a new beginning. Guilt and regret, that's, that's, that's backward thinking. That's, 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 that's from Satan. But, but, but conviction regarding the future, that's from the Lord. And so, so the Lord, He draws us in, He compels us today he convicts us in the most beautiful sense of the word that, that today can be a new beginning. Today can be a fresh start. <clears throat> so I'll tell you one of the things that I'm doing starting today, fresh start, new beginning, is I am, I am returning to a habit that I had for about nine or ten months last year up until... Uh, October, uh, up until October where it crashed and burned. Um, I was reading through, as I, as I try to do, or as I do most years, I was reading through the Bible. It's not, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not me preparing for a sermon. I read the Bible a lot in, to, to prepare to preach. I read, I read a lot uh, in my other studies of the Bible more. Um, yeah, but, 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 but then I also simply read through the Bible. And so last year I was doing that, and about October some things happened in my life, and there were some stresses and there were distractions, and I just decided, and I didn't feel guilty about it, I decided I'm going to end it 
for the year, made it through a good part of the Bible. I'm going to end this daily reading, and I'm going to pick it up in January 1st. So today's January 1st. And so I, I think we've got to, I, I want you to, this is maybe feels a little bit hokey or, 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 or uh, clunky, but, but I just want to encourage you to maybe get this app. This is how I'm, I'm going to be reading through the Bible this year. I'm using the one-year chronological Bible, which means that, well, means what it means. Reading through the Bible chronologically. I'm not going to unpack that, but if you don't know exactly what that means, we can talk about it later. But it's really helpful. For instance, um, it helped me read through the book of Psalms because I, I, admitted, I admitted this to somebody the other day. I, um, I mean, this, this part isn't an admission. You know this. Historically, I've been an artist. I've been a musician. Um, I should love art. I should love the book of Psalms. But I've just never been a really big fan of the book of Psalms. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that. Who did I say that to the other day? I'm trying to determine if it was one of you guys. Anyway, somebody said that, and I said, yeah, me too. I've never really liked the book of Psalms, but here's, here's what I did, or here's how that changed for me this year. As I'm reading through the book, through the Bible chronologically, um, what happens is you read some of David's, um, King David's um, low points, and then the next day in the reading, you read whatever psalm we believe uh, historically corresponded to that event, and all of a sudden, that psalm comes alive. It, it becomes richer. And so, so chronologically, I'm taking way too much time on this, but it's important. If you don't even hear my sermon today, but if you decide to read through the Bible this year, it's a win. So I use this, I use this one-year chronological Bible. There are a group of men that we would get here every Wednesday, and we would talk about what we'd read that week and, and uh, pray for one another. And, uh, and, and so anyway, I thought I'd be kind of cool or maybe silly if I, uh, hopefully, hopefully cool, if I uh, actually show you how this works. So it's, uh, it's the, um, the app is the U version, right, I believe. It's the Bible app. Uh, and then I go to my plan, my one-year chronological Bible, and then check this out. So cool. This is how I do it. Come on. Genesis 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their Can you hear that? Array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Doesn't he have an awesome voice? I mean, just that's, that's just worth, that's worth the app alone. Just listen to that man's voice. I don't know who it is, but he's got the, I wish I had a voice like that. Anyway, so what I do, what I did last year, um, it's the first year that I switched over to an app. I'd always, I'd always read through the Bible, you know, the, the, the paper version, and that's great. It's great. Uh, but, but last year when I switched over to the app, what I would do is I had it on my screen, and I would listen to it. And that also just really enriched my reading. So I thought I'd do this. Um, last year, I told you I was doing this, and several, several of you jumped on board. Some of you are the men in my group. Some of you did it, read as families. But if you, um, I'm not gonna, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I just want to kind of show you collectively kind of what happened last year. If you, even if you crashed and burned, you know, in like March or April, but if you at some point... In, in 2022, made an attempt to read <clears throat> through the Bible, as many of us did, would you raise your hand so I can just, yeah, a lot of you did. Yeah, a lot of you did. Good, good. So let's do it again. Make my, again, my point is, it's a fresh start, new beginning. Last year, even if you didn't make it through the whole Bible, that wasn't a failure. You made it through more of the Bible than perhaps you did the year before. So let's do it again. I'm excited. I hope you will join me. Send me a note. I, I remember about this time last year, many of you sending me notes. I was kind of surprised how many people were, were reading through the Bible. Send me a note. Let me know you're doing that. Send Pastor Billy a note. Let him know, and that'll be awesome. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let me, let me, just, let me just say this, and then we'll jump right into the passage. Why should I read my Bible? Well, historically... Historically, studying Scripture has been, uh, it, it has been a spiritual, you're not going to like this word, but it's a really good word, discipline that disciples of Jesus have engaged in. That's not a new practice. You could tell me, well, you know, Pastor Randy, in the Middle Ages, people didn't have Bibles. Or, you know, I know that there were blips on the screen, where people, but historically, all the way back to the, the, the Old Testament, People of God studied God's Word. That is, a, <clears throat> that is a spiritual discipline. 
By the way, we're going to be talking today about spiritual disciplines. That's one of them, study. Romans chapter 12, Paul says that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's Romans 12 too. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So you read Scripture and you, it, 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 it recalibrates your, your thoughts. It gives you a, a, a new perspective. Like, oh wow, I was really thinking about life through, the, through the, the world's perspective, but I'm now reading my Bible and it's changing. It's moving me into the kingdom of heaven as, I, as my thoughts are being righted and aligned with God's thoughts. Philippians 4.8 says this. I'm going I'm to read it to you. It says, whatever is true, honorable, lovely, just, pure, gracious, think on these things. There's so, there's so much in your phone uh, or, or in the, the podcast that I choose to listen to or the, the cable news channel that you have going when you're, when you're cooking in the evening. There's so much, there's so much that, we, that we feed ourselves that, 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 is, that are not. There is not true, honorable, lovely, just, pure, gracious. But Paul invites us to think on the things that are true and lovely and gracious and pure, just. And how might we do that? By taking a daily dose of God's Word into our lives. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, I really do. Scripture reading, study, one spiritual discipline. There are others. <clears throat> Let's take a look at them today. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6. Jesus introduces three spiritual disciplines. He's going to do them in, in, a, in a way in which he cautions us against some negative habits. But don't let that <clears throat> distract you from the fact that Jesus is also telling us how we might practice these disciplines rightly. Let's jump right in. Jesus says this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. Now, you might say right now, well, Pastor Randy, why'd you have us raise our hand and tell, and tell one another that we, that we, that we read our Bible? Because Jesus said, don't do that. Like, don't, don't admit, that, don't, don't, don't practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. I'll explain what I think Jesus is and isn't saying there in just a minute, because we all struggle with that. Should I let people know? Should I not let be careful not to practice the righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. All right, now he's going to talk about three practices. Three. There are others, but he's talking about three of them today. The first one is giving. So when you give to the needy, historically that would be called almsgiving. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. What an interesting statement. Verse 3, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. <clears throat> Verse 5, And when you pray... It's another spiritual discipline, giving, now praying. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, again, this, this curious phrase, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Verse 6, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen, then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then, I'm intentionally skipping the next... Uh, 
five or six verses, he goes into the Lord's Prayer. I'm skipping it because we are going to deal with that next week. That's not the point of today's sermon. He talks about giving in secret. He talks about praying in secret. And then, sort of parenthetically, he gives us an example of how to pray. We'll hit that next week. Let's skip all the way down to verse 16. And he speaks of the third spiritual discipline that we're going to talk about today. Verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber, that's sad, somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show, their, to show others they are fasting. By the way, do you know, most of you do, but maybe some of you don't know what fasting is. Fasting is when you skip, when you stop eating for a season, maybe a day or two, um, or, or maybe you, for a few people even more than a, a day or two. You, 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 you don't eat for a season that you might focus your time and your hunger and your thoughts, not on the internet, but on God. It's historically a um, a spiritual discipline. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. And then, in this this poetical device, or this, 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 uh, this, Jesus says, truly I tell you, again, they have received their reward in full. Verse 17 and, and we're almost done here. But when you fast, um, when you fast, put, on, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting. But only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Now, if there is one main theme, one big idea that could be lost in the woods today, because I've got, I've got some, 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 uh, some other ideas, some thoughts from this passage which are true and right and good, life-giving, but if there is one, and there is, one big idea that could be lost in the woods today, if we're not careful, it is this. The Lord plans for you great reward. And for eternity. And if you're an accountant, if you're a financial dude, if you just if you if you just love numbers, I really I really enjoy numbers because they don't they don't lie like they're 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 honest and they're always the same. You know, if if you're if you love numbers, if you're an accountant, what you should love is the fact that that, that, that God today says, look, don't 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 settle for an immediate payout. Because what the Lord has for you is this exponentially greater and never-ending reward for eternity that just, just continues paying out dividends for as long as eternity is. Let's not, let's not lose that in the, in, the, in, the, in the woods, in the forest, let's not lose this one great truth. The the Lord isn't holding out on you. The Lord has for you great reward. And what he says is, don't settle for the silly temporary reward that the world offers you. Great is your reward in the kingdom of heaven. That means it it doesn't just start when you die. It can start for you now. All right. Giving to the poor... Praying, fasting. They are given by Jesus as um, spiritual disciplines, uh, devotional practices. I'm talking about them today because they're, they're where we landed in Scripture, but I believe it providential because it's, it's the beginning of the year. And, and, and Jesus says, you, you, you practice these habits and, and great will... Great will be the reward that you will receive from our Heavenly Father. And so I want to push you. I want you to, I want you to lean in. I want you to consider, to, 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 I want you to consider beginning or, or beginning again these habits. 
giving, praying, and fasting. These disciplines, in fact, in, in, in Jesus' day, and even before Jesus' day, have been a part of Jewish worship for centuries. Um, it's interesting, these three, these three practices are actually uh, three of the five pillars of, of Islam. You may or may not care about that, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting fact. Uh, children of God, the nation of Israel, and Christians, disciples, we have been um, practicing these habits for many, many centuries. And so if, if it's not part of your life, then you're, you're somewhat of a, an anomaly. I mean, you could, you could jump on board and, and be in good company. Uh, Jesus is not seeking to end these practices. That's my point. Even though he speaks negatively about how you might um, engage in these habits, he is not seeking to end them or to discourage you from them. Quite the opposite. These disciplines were a part of Jesus' life. These disciplines were a part of Jesus' disciples' life. Um, discipline is a part of being a disciple, right? I mean, you hear the similarity in the words. So this new attitude that Jesus introduces, is not, it's not discouraging, but rather what he's doing is he's focus, he's, the, the focus is on avoiding ostentation, which means showing off. And that's in keeping with, with the Beatitudes that, that we've already studied, that Jesus is teaching already, right? It's very much in keeping with Jesus', with Jesus other teachings. Like, I, I, avoid ostentation. Avoid showing off. Be humble in your practice. In G, is Jesus saying... In this passage, don't, don't, don't answer out loud, but I think this is a, an important question. You're probably already asking it yourself. Is Jesus saying that our devotional life, our spiritual disciplines, um, should not be public? Don't don't answer out loud. Wrestle with that for a moment yourself. And and I I'm gonna I'm going to say as your pastor, I don't think that's exactly what he's saying. I mean, to some degree it is, right? Like don't show off. Don't 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 be doing it in a prideful way, such that your 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 ultimate game, aim uh, goal is to get praise from others. But, but listen to this. If Jesus is saying, don't, don't get together and say, hey, hey, Johnny, like I read through, I, I got through my, my Bible reading today, did you? And, and then, you know, Johnny's like, well, we're not supposed to talk about that. But Jesus said, don't talk about that. Now, I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. I don't think Jesus is saying, like, like, like um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't encourage one another in our, in our giving, for instance. In fact, Paul, to some some very poor churches and some very zealous churches. Paul writes letters encouraging them to give and discussing how much other churches have been giving to, to the, the poor in Jerusalem. And, and so if Jesus is saying never talk about your Bible reading, never talk about giving, never that shouldn't be a public thing, then there are other places in, in Scripture that seem to not jive with that teaching. I'll give you an, an, another example. In Matthew 5, we studied this a few weeks ago. Jesus said this, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's that whole teaching of like we're the light of the world, like the lamp should be put on a lamp, or the, the light should be put on a lampstand, not hidden away. And Jesus says, like, your good deeds, like people see you and, and, and it brings glory to God. So it's not exactly, I don't think, correct to say that Jesus is saying that at, at every turn, our spiritual disciplines should be completely private and not discussed. I don't think that's what he's saying. I do think that he is saying or condemning the prideful 
arrogant, boastful um, habit of letting everyone know about your, 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 your spiritual discipline. All right, let's jump in. I think I got five, five uh, quick, quick thoughts here. Number one is this. The disciple's life is, I believe, inevitably and rightly public. I, I think Jesus makes it clear that, it, that we would do well. We would do well with the right heart attitude. We would do well to, to allow other people, unbelievers in our lives, to see, to peer into our lives and, and say, like, wow, so, like, the Caulfields, they, they're all in when it comes to Jesus. Like, like, their lifestyle, how they spend their money, how they spend their time, how they, how they spend their evenings reading the Bible instead of bowling or whatever. Not, not that against bowling. Uh, not, not that anybody does that anymore, but uh, it, I, 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 Jesus is... Strong, strongly encourages us to allow our lives as Christ followers to, to be seen by others. Um, but that does not entitle us to show off. There's a difference between striving for devotion and other people see you in your striving, and on the other hand, working for a reputation. There's, there's a difference between striving for devotion and other people see it and striving to build your own reputation. There's a difference in motive. We know that. One is I'm trying to, I want, I want to, 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 to know Jesus better. And the other motive is I want people to know me better. So there's a difference in motivation. But get this, there's also a difference in result. There is also a difference in in result. The result of one is that it brings glory to God, and, and the result of the other is that it brings glory to oneself. It's the second idea I have, that there is, there is a difference in, uh, there, there are two different types of reward in life. We've, we kind of already talked about that with the summary of, of the kingdom of heaven earlier. That Jesus calls us to strive for the reward that the Lord has for us. One of the results is the reward that God promises, but in the other case, there's still a reward. The reward is what you want, what you get, and that is attention. The attention of, of, of other human beings. And Jesus says clearly, I, I pointed it out, I, I drew it out, he clearly says the man, that, that man has already received his reward, the praise of his peers. He got what he wanted. I think we have Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. Or, or, Jesus says, maybe the second best reward is no reward in heaven, but everybody thinks you're cool here on earth. Which, which, is, a, which, is, which is a sad second place, isn't it? Jesus says the show off, he gets what he wants. She gets what she deserves. The praise of others. But, but he or she misses out on the true, true reward, which comes from our Father in heaven. Third idea out of this passage is this. Giving in Jesus' day was an act of obedience, not merely a philanthropic option. It's kind of hard for me to say it that way, but I, I, I thought, through, <laughs> thought through this. I think it's worth saying. I think it's necessary because it's the best thing that I can say to you. Historically, throughout time, throughout the Old Testament, temple, synagogue, all the way through the New Testament, all the way through the the the. the, the, the the impoverished Macedonians and the impoverished uh, church in Jerusalem, all the way through to 21st century Christianity, giving has always been an act of obedience. Not, not an option that maybe in 2023 you can afford or, or maybe one day you, you, know, you, you can be more philanthropic, you can give and it'll feel good, but right now it's not an option. I mean, 
That is your choice. But in Jesus' teaching, in the teaching the teachings of the Apostle Paul, it has never been like this option that maybe one day you'll get to. In fact, in, fact, in Jesus' day, at this stage, uh, when Matthew, when, 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 the, when these, uh, these events are, are playing out, at this stage in Judaism, giving as a religious act was remarkably well organized. Everyone knew how much they ought to give, and they knew that there would be a certain percentage that it would be uh, to, to given uh, to take care of the poor in their community. There was a percentage that would be given to, uh, that would be used to, to take care of the, the widows in their community. There was a, a percentage that would be given that would be to take care of the synagogue or to take care of the priests in the temple, to, to take care of the religious activity, to keep the place up to keep the place looking good, that God's glory might shine from the temple. So, so there was nothing nebulous. Jesus doesn't unpack it in great detail because he doesn't need to. He's speaking to a Jewish audience, and they know all the details. They know how remarkably well organized the system of giving was in that day. Jesus doesn't have to say, oh, you ought to give. It's a good idea. It's not an option. No, they're already they, they know that. He is simply saying, what is your heart attitude when you're giving? The assumption that Jesus makes is that they are giving. He's just dealing with the heart attitude. Jesus expects his disciples to give generously, but not conspicuously. And therefore, he speaks of the reward that will come for the humble giver, the, the humble <clears throat> giver. Number four, fourth idea. Now we're going to get into the second and the third uh, disciplines. Number four, prayer is to be thoughtful and non-mechanical. This is the second disciple or the second discipline that he deals with. He deals with giving. Now he's dealing with praying. It's, it's, worth, it's worth me pointing out, worth me noting that, that Jesus in this passage is not, that his teaching is not a prohibition on repetition in prayer. What he's prohibiting, what he's speaking against is mindless, mindless repetition. I have to say that for myself, if nobody else, because there are days where I go on, a, where I, I, I go, you guys know that I I, I, uh, historically, I've, I've prayed when I've walked. Um, I haven't done that so much as much I've prayed, but I haven't walked and prayed so, so much in the last few months. But when, I, when life really gets tough, when I'm really beside myself, when I really have like, the, the things that really weigh me down, then you can come out and bathe you and you'll see me walking. Because that's when I go, that's when I go on these walks and I pray. And boy, if, 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 if repetition is prohibited by Jesus, then I'm breaking the rules because there are days where... I don't even know what I'm praying. It's just, it's just help me, Holy Spirit. Pray for me, Holy Spirit. And sometimes, some days, it's just groaning that's coming out. And it's, it's awfully repetitious. Because when we don't know what we need to pray for, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit prays for us in our, in our groaning. And Jesus isn't prohibiting repetition in prayer. He is prohibiting, cautioning us against mindless repetition. I don't believe that, that Jesus is, is even um, prohibiting uh, set forms of prayers. I mean, he taught us how to pray, right? Next week we're talking about the Lord's Prayer. Praying that prayer on a regular basis as a set form, as a sort of an outline that you, is awesome. Jesus is saying, Jesus is simply saying, be thoughtful. Don't be mechanical. 
And he says things like, don't heap up empty praises. Don't babble on while, while you're babble on while your mind is, you know, at Starbucks, but, 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 your, but your mouth's still droning on. Don't, don't pray with one eye open and wondering who's seeing you pray. Prayer is to be thoughtful. Said a different way, prayer is to be simply authentic. Just, just be yourself. You probably have friends, like the type of friends that, 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 that we have, that some of whom are, you know, they've, they've, they've grown up in the church, but maybe a different tradition than you grew up in. Maybe they didn't grow up evangelical, or they didn't grow up in the Protestant church. And when you, when you, um, you know, delightful people, um, but they maybe aren't necessarily comfortable, like we can pray, like just out loud by ourselves. I just love to introduce this thought that just be authentic. Just be yourself. Just talk to the Lord. You don't, you don't have to sound like a pastor or a priest or a nun. Or, you just, just talk to the Lord like you're, like you're talking to a parent, like a good parent, like a benevolent parent, like a loving parent. Just talk to him. Do I do that when I'm driving down the road and I just talk to the Lord? I do that when I'm on going on a run in between gasping for air. I, I, I do that when I'm, when I'm running the Arroyo, taking the boat out, about to hit Parker Lake or whatever I'm going to do on, on the way out. I'm just the, 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 the drone or the motor, and I, I, I'm praying out loud, but nobody knows it because you can't hear me, but the Lord does. Just be authentic. Just simply talk to the Lord. Last idea out of this passage today is this. The disciple... When fasting, number five, the disciple when fasting should look clean and happy and well-groomed. You know, as well-groomed as you normally are. You don't have to be extra well-groomed, but just, just look yourself. Just look normal. The Pharisees, the religious people um, who were often pointed out by Jesus is pretty hypocritical. The Pharisees in that day, and I don't think they all were, but, 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 but Jesus, he makes a, a point of saying that the, these, generally speaking, they're, they're hypocritical. And in, in, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees, um, according to history, they may, have, uh, they may have fasted, probably fasted up to two or twice a week. That would have been like normal for them. So maybe like on a Monday and a Wednesday, they go the whole day without eating. That they might study, that they might pray, they might meditate. The problem wasn't that they were fasting. The problem from Jesus' teaching was that they were making sure others knew it. They're looking all distraught, you know, sucking their cheeks in so it looked like they'd been fasting so much that they'd lost weight. Um, tightening their belt, whatever. You know, they, they, were, they, they wanted people to know that they're fasting. Let's be honest. Every one of us has thought at times about, Man, I've, I've done so much for the Lord this year. I wonder if anybody's noticed. And Jesus cautions us. He says, that's not the best thing for you because you're going to get a lesser reward. You're going to get the praise of humans. Jesus says there's a much greater reward for you to strive after. Jesus says when you fast, and I don't know that many of us um, in this room really, really have made that a part of our lives, but this year we're going we're gonna to go a little harder after that discipline as a church. Jesus says when you fast, keep it to yourself. Your aim isn't to impress others, but your aim is to know your Heavenly Father better. Yes, to please Him, we could say it that way, but it, I think even if we drill down even deeper than that, yes, pleasing Him, but getting to know your Heavenly Father in an intimate, supernatural sort of way. So we're going to be talking about more. There are other disciplines. We'll be talking about more about them uh, over the next few weeks. But here's how I want to land this play. I'm going to give you some tips 
for practicing devotion in the new year. It's January 1st. Maybe you'd say, like, I want to do some of that. I want to, I want to get that Bible app. I want, to, I want to start praying on a regular basis. Here, here's here are four ideas, and we're going to pray, and we're going to run figuratively, spiritually, to the table of communion and celebrate Jesus. Tips for practicing devotion in the new year. Number one, make a thoughtful plan for giving this year. And then follow through with it. Lydia and I have found that when we give uh, to the church, give to River Church, when we give first and according to a plan, that, that really, really leads to success. When we, when we give after we've, you know, made the house payment and, and had tacos next door and all that, that, that just weird how money runs out. I'm not haranguing you or harassing you about, about giving, but, but Jesus, Jesus compels us with the assumption that you are going to give. He compels us to give with the right attitude. And so to make a thoughtful plan this year and, and, and then follow through with it. Number two, take your prayer life to a deeper level this year. That sounds kind of trite, but, but, but what I mean is if you have only been praying at church um, then, 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 then try something a little deeper. Go a little further this year. Go home. It seems like always this time of year I tell you to go home and make a cup of tea. Go home and make a cup of tea and sit down this afternoon um, and, 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 and simply pray. Authentically talk to the Lord. Take your prayer life to a deeper level this year. And then the Lord will tell you how to do that. Maybe you take some notes, write something down. Number three, choose a day in January. And I say that because if you keep waiting, the whole year may pass and you may not, not even fast. Take, choose, a day, choose a day in January and try some fasting. I'm going to do that in January. If you need some tips or if you need some, you know, some encouragement, let Pastor Billy know. Let me know. Um, <clears throat> maybe you've tried it in the past and it's been a while. Give it another try. Last thought Last practical um, idea would be read a book about spiritual disciplines. And I have the book for you. Um, I think we have a photo of it. Um, If you're like old like me or you're older, you may have read this book in the 70s or the 80s. Or uh, this this is a book that has staying power. This is a book that's been around for a long time called The Celebration of Discipline. And it deals with spiritual disciplines that <clears throat> to some degree have been lost in the, in the American church, in the church in the United States. It deals with prayer, fasting, study, simplicity and solitude. Meditation, which has historically been a part of the church, the Christian church. So anyway, I um, encourage you to, if you're wondering this year, how can I go a little deeper in these spiritual disciplines? Richard Foster wrote a book in the 70s, and it is worth your time. I've been rereading it last, yesterday. I just read a good, a good portion of it just yesterday. So that, those are my thoughts. Here, here's what I'm... <clears throat> here's what I... Here's what I am uh, praying for you this year. And let this be a blessing over you, and then we'll go to the table of communion. My, my, my prayer for you, much like I prayed for you Christmas Eve, is that this for you will be a, a breakout year. That, that this for you will be your, your best year yet. That this will be the year in which you will begin seeing yourself through the lens through which your Heavenly Father sees you. That shame and, and regret, embarrassment, old reputations, that, that all that would fall away and that you would now see yourself through the lens of Jesus Christ as a new creation in Him. 
Amen. Would you bow with me and let's pray together. God, we celebrate your goodness today. Heavenly Father, we celebrate your goodness today in the sending of your, your son. Long ago, you looked down on the brokenness of humanity and determined to do something about it. Long ago, you determined that you would enter into the brokenness of humanity and you would do something about it. And you determined, Heavenly Father, to, to clear the highest hurdle that's ever been cleared, and that is you determined to send your Son as, as the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world. And we celebrate you, Heavenly Father. Jesus, Our, our Messiah, our, our Savior, our Lord, we, we celebrate you today. In, in your obedience to the Father, you, you, didn't, you didn't consider heaven something to be grasped or be held on to, but you determined to, in obedience to the Father, humble yourself and to come to earth and to enter into our mess. You you loved us to the degree that you, you determined to enter into our mess and do something about it and relate to, to us. And so now you're, you're a sympathetic high priest, as described in the book of Hebrews. You're, you're a sympathetic counselor. You have been tempted in every way, just like us, and yet you are sinless. And so, Jesus, we celebrate you. As, as the Apostle Paul said, you humbled yourself, you humbled yourself to the point of death, the sacrificial lamb, and now, and now what we know is that, that, that every knee will one day bow, and every tongue will one day confess that, that you, Jesus Christ, are Lord. We celebrate you, Jesus. And, and Holy Spirit, we, we welcome here, you here today. Of course, you're welcome. You go where you please, but you're welcome here today. It's that We don't want to miss you. We want to experience you. Would you move? among us in a in a mysterious and supernatural and beautifully healing way holy spirit would you move among us we pray for the father the son and the holy spirit